The Navy admitted for the first time that several UFO videos were real. We are honored to have back Father Dr. Ian Nutzi, who is an expert in demonology, eschatology, and mystical theology, and he has written many academic works on these topics. Father Nutzi was one of the four selected students to receive a grant from the Pontifical Biblical University of Rome to study theology in the Holy Land. While in Rome, he was mentored by the exorcist Father Gabriella Morth, who trained him in exorcisms and the demonic. He has been featured on many religious media outlets, including EWTN, and his ministry of teaching continues to be internationally broadcasted. Father, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to our audience today. Thank you for having me. Father, could you uh, start us off, please, with a prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father, many of your previous presentations, especially on this channel, concerning demonology, they've garnered much attention and they've provoked interest and questions. In fact, Armor of God YouTube station contacted me with a list of many questions from various individuals on the topic of demonology. So I'd like to pose some of those questions to you tonight for you to address. So the theme of our discussion will be the Vatican, our Christian faith, and the possibility of extraterrestrial life. We have crashed craft uh, stated earlier. Do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? Uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Um, were they human or non-human biologics? Non-human. Non so Father, the first question is with the recent government hearings and information about UFOs and extraterrestrials, many Christians are confused and concerned about how this impacts their faith. Catholic social media is tapping into this anxiety and they're promoting this theory that all aliens are demons even that there's a global conspiracy to build UFOs to cover up the demon activity that is currently in the skies. So Father, in light of these ideas circulating and this anxiety, could you speak to the Catholic position on non-human and non-angelic intelligent life within the cosmos? First and foremost, we have to remember that the Catholic Church has no official position on whether or not extraterrestrials exist. It's not a matter of dogmatic nor doctrinal theology, but of speculative theology, meaning the question is still open to free discussion. Therefore, for one to say, to be a Catholic, you must, must accept or reject the possibility of extraterrestrial life is not Catholic. It's a question that has not been brought to the fore of the Catholic academic world because it doesn't impact our faith directly. Whether they do or don't exist does not directly impact our faith. Father, there is an argument being floated around about the catechism. Some claim that it specifically denies the existence of extraterrestrials. Only humans and angels exist, and that Catholic intellectuals, clergy, and leaders are in heresy for considering the evidence of alien life that is being brought forward now. Three retired military veterans told Congress today that the government is covering up evidence of UFOs. Father, does the catechism condemn considering the evidence of non-human and non-angelic life? Absolutely not, because number one, the church has not taught it definitively in this regard. Therefore, for one to say it's heretical, they are self-incriminating, spiritually speaking, because there is no heresy unless the church has definitively taught in the regard of this matter. So if the church has not pronounced itself, it's a matter open to free discussion. To call this person a heretic because they don't conform with my opinion is really silly. Second, the catechism is not 
an infallible document, nor can it be placed on the same level of divine inspiration as the inerrant word of God, namely sacred scripture, nor tradition, which when taught among the fathers in unanimity is equal with scripture and its authority. The catechism does not enjoy that level of divine authoritative teaching. Why? Well, because the catechism contains many different documents that vary in levels of teaching authority. They range from such teachings as those of the Pope, whether it's a solemn definition, which is at the top, or a papal bull or an apostolic constitution or a motu proprio, an encyclical, an apostolic exhortation and a letter, the list goes on and on. They do not all enjoy the same level of authoritative teaching. So when we are speaking of the teaching of the church on extraterrestrials, which is not definitive, you're open to believe it, Actually, the church encourages, to, encourages you to believe it. Even the Vatican priest in charge of the observatory has said we should believe because there's a lot of reason to. We come to a catechism article that teaches that man is created among all the visible creatures, I'm paraphrasing, to love and know God. But does this mean that there are no other visible creatures? So let's address this issue here. Of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator. Article 356 of the Catechism. People say, oh, because of this, there can be no other visible creatures throughout the cosmos. Well, is that what the Catechism says? Continue to read it. It adds, man is the only creature on earth, right here, that God has willed for its own sake. And he alone is called to, by knowledge and love in God's own life. Now, if we take this literally, it's false. Why? Because man is not the only creature called by knowledge and love to share in God's own life. We know from the teachings of the church, the fathers, even the catechism, scripture, that the angels are called by knowledge and love in God's own life. St. Thomas Aquinas even states as much. When he put out a work on the angelic salutation of the Indra Gabriel to Mary, he stated in quotes, the angels far exceed men in the fullness of the splendor of divine grace. This is Thomas Aquinas. Angels far exceed men in the fullness of the splendor of divine grace. And then he adds, for angels participate in the highest degree in the divine light. And then he talks about how Mary excelled the angels because she was full of grace, which not all of us are. So the point is that if we take this catechetical instruction literally, which is of the low authority of church teaching, this article, Three, five, six. It's not, and by a long shot, at the top of the or teachings of divine authority in the church. Literally, if we take this literally, we misinterpret the meaning. It means that of all the visible beings on earth, that's the point it's making. It's not talking about visible beings in every sense of the word, because as I mentioned, angels have become visible many times in the Bible, and they know and love God. And even sacred scripture talks about angels possessing the knowledge of God. For example. 2 Samuel 14, 17, Galatians 3, 19, Acts 7, 53, and that they worship him, they love him, they adore him. Psalm 103, 20, Psalm 148, 1 through 2, and this goes on and on. But God has raised us because of the incarnation of Christ in a human nature to a higher degree than that of the angels, not of intellectual prowess or knowledge, but of nobility and dignity. And therefore the letter to the Hebrews, chapter one, speaks of how the angels minister to us. We don't minister to the angels. Even Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians article, chapter six, verse three states, do you not know that we will judge angels because of our nobility? Christ's incarnation in a human, not an angelic nature, elevated our nature to a level that exceeds that of the angels in nobility and dignity, not in knowledge. And as I mentioned, the Vatican chief astronomer, Father Jose Funes, said that, and I'm going to quote to you from him, in my opinion, the possibility of life on other planets exists. The possibility of life on other planets exists. This is a statement from the Vatican chief astronomer. And he says, there's no conflict between believing in God and then the possibility of extraterrestrial brothers. He uses that word brothers. So they're not all evil as some of these crackle barrel theologians who have no degree in theology are claiming on the internet, saying, oh, they're all evil, they're fallen angels, they're possessing. No, 
They're not angels. They're not humans. They are entities, as St. Padre Pio stated, that are visible, that are physical, but that are not on earth. They may visit the earth, but they're not from here. We are created from the dust of the earth, and we shall return to it. This is the meaning of the Catechism. The Catechism, Article 356, states, Man is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake, and then it adds, he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. And I mentioned the angel share in this as well. So this catechism needs to be better articulated. Why do I say that? Because there have been over 75 changes in the catechism in the history of the Catholic Church. This is a fact. Over 75 articles have changed in the Catholic catechism because many low-level authority teachings in the catechism are poorly articulated and need to be better articulated. Some can even literally change, like that which happened in our lifetime on the part of Pope Francis, when he said that by virtue of our knowledge and growth and the dignity of the human person, which we did not possess for a long time, and the dignity of the woman, etc., the death penalty is something that should be avoided and must be avoided. We're beyond that. We're not barbarians anymore. We're not living eye for nine and tooth for two. And he changed that article in the catechism. And you can do that. Again, the church over the centuries has changed the catechism over 75 times. Now, I want to share with you one passage of Louisa, because she's the subject of my doctoral dissertation. Jesus states this to Louisa in volume 17, October 30th, 1924. Do you know why there are different choirs of angels, one superior to the other? There are some which are closer to my throne, and do you know why? It is because my will revealed itself in one single operation, but to some with one single extension of knowledge and qualities, knowledge and qualities to the angels, to others with two extensions, to some with three and others with four and so on, up to the nine choirs. So here the Lord is telling us that the angels are given knowledge, not just man. And yet in this catechism article 356, it states, he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. Well, the angels do too. So you see, you can't take this literally. And this should be articulated better, 356. And I'm sure it will be in the future. As I quote John Paul II, <laughs> the Holy Father, what about the aliens? He doesn't say, if they exist, then so-and-so. His simple answer is, they're God's children too. I want to share word in scripture of universe that's used in Psalm 24 or 23 verse 1. Depending upon the Bible, it's 24. Another the Bible is 23, but it's always verse 1. But it states that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and the universe and all of its inhabitants. Mm. The universe and all of its inhabitants, implying the universe is inhabited. Now, the word that's used in Hebrew here in Psalm is tebal, tebal. And it's found in Isaiah 14, 17. It's found in Job. It's found in First Chronicles. In these cases, it's used not as earth, which it can be in some cases, or world. In these cases, it's used as universe. So the scripture says that the universe is inhabited. Monsignor Corrado Balducci. And he was an exorcist. He passed away recently, 2008. Mm -hmm. And he was a Catholic theologian, a demonologist, and he worked for the Vatican Curia and was a very close friend to the Pope. And um, he worked with Father Amoth, my mentor, and he was a prelate for the Congregation of Evangelization and for the Society of uh, Propagation of the Faith. And he wrote several articles on exorcisms and extraterrestrials. He's given many interviews and has had translators with him in which he shows images on in these interviews of extraterrestrial craft, craft that's not of this world. For example, one I believe was taken in Florida, I think it was Pensacola, where these craft form a cross mm -hmm. in the sky and they were traveling in sync. And he was saying when showing this to the audience that some of these ETs acknowledge Jesus Christ.
Now, Father, I'm going to ask you to just to speculate. You mentioned some of the suggestions of Monsignor Balducci about the craft you mentioned, forming the cross, and that some of these non-human beings might know and serve Jesus, might know and serve God. If one-third of beings fell with the angels, are there hostile, anti-Christian alien beings that are at war with friendly alien beings? What would you speculate and just speculation of what's the relationship between the fallen beings and us and what's keeping them off of this earth if they're more advanced than us? Well, you mentioned that one third of the beings fell and this goes all the way back to Revelation chapter 12 verses 4 through 9 that one third of the stars fell. It does not mention a third of the angels now. In scripture, the expression stars may refer to Jesus Christ, such as the case in Revelation chapter 22. It may refer to Lucifer, as in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. It can refer to the king of Babylon, whose actions were predicated upon the evil actions of Lucifer, which is Isaiah 14. But in scripture, stars also refers to all rational beings including those throughout the cosmos. This is alluded to in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, Philippians 2, 15. The point is, one must avoid theological reductionism, which takes stars and applies it to only one group of individuals, like the angels. Hmm. And in Christian circles, this has been the case. They interpret this passage of Revelation, referring to a third of the stars, as meaning only, only a third of the angels. The church does not teach that it refers only to the angels. Yes, it includes the angels because stars is referred to as angels, as is Jesus Christ, as are believers, but it doesn't limit it to just the angels. So it is theologically sound to propose that one third of all rational beings fell with Lucifer. Therefore, this may explain in part the difference between the good beings throughout the cosmos that are supported by many eyewitness testimonies as well as the bad ones throughout the cosmos well considering that only one third fell the good outnumber the bad <laughs> again it's speculative theology i'm talking about here not dogmatic not doctrinal but it's a founded theological speculation grounded upon eyewitness reports, traditional teachings, apparition revelations proved by the church and scripture itself. Let's go to scripture, the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve were created, according to biblical genealogies, 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago, after he committed original sin, Cain and Abel, Cain just walked up and killed Abel because God preferred Abel's sacrifice. Then God puts a mark on Cain, why? so that nobody would harm him. Hmm. Well, if Adam and Eve were the only two people there, why would he have to put on a mark? Unless others were there that could harm him. We also find in the same book of Genesis, Deuteronomy, there were these beings that fell from above. They call the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. Now, what are these beings that fell from above? The word Nephilim in Hebrew doesn't mean angels. It means beings that didn't come but fell from above. And this is found in Genesis 6-4, it's found in Numbers 13-31. But these Nephilim are just one of several unexplained beings in the Old Testament that were here. But what's interesting about these Nephilim is that they had relations with the daughters of men. Who are these beings? The church does not teach definitively on this. It only gives us suggestions or opinions or theories and footnotes. But we do know that as soon as these Nephilim that fell from above were having relations with the daughters of men, the inhabitants were so evil, God sent a flood. The Anakites, these were another unknown um, civilization of beings in Canaan around the time, shortly after Adam. Or to, it was actually, they were probably there before Adam. Mm -hmm. But we know that they're described in a way that suggests that they were very large beings, almost giants. For example, Deuteronomy 2.10, 21, 
uh, Deuteronomy 9.2, Numbers 13.32-33. And then you have these other beings called the Emites that were very strong people and as tall as the Anakites. This is found in Deuteronomy 2.10. And the list goes on. We also have evidence of archaeological findings that reveal that there were civilizations buried underground for millennia that predate 4000 BC. For example, there's a place called Kataloihuk. Kataloihuk. It's a funny word it's pronounced. And it was apparently founded, it's been dated to 9000 BC. I've discovered by archaeologists. And then we have these pictographs, etchings in caves throughout the world that go so far as almost 39,000 BC. And the oldest known pictograph is in the upper Paleolithic area of um, El Castillo. Point is, it's very likely, and it's proven archeologically and historically, that there are images and writings in stone, cuneiform hieroglyphics, that predate the 4000 BC creation of Adam and Eve. These were not humans. These were very likely beings, but from where we don't know. The Samaritan texts bear witness to this. And the scholar that recently died, Zechariah Stitching, who interpreted Sanskrit and Samaritan, which only like four people on earth can read, he was very clear that, and he can show the actual cuneiforms, they knew the solar system thousands of years before we discovered it. <laughs> you could see nine planets. Now, it's funny that they had nine planets because we did not know this until just a few years ago when NASA revealed that there was a ninth planet orbiting apparently the sun. In 2015, NASA researchers found mathematical evidence suggesting that there may be what's called a planet X, or they call it a ninth planet. And they say it has a mass about 10 times that of the Earth and orbits about 20 times farther from the sun on the average than Neptune. But that they have confirmed through the scientists, the Caltech researchers, is that it certainly may exist. It may take between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years to make one full orbit around the sun. But today, scientists from the California Institute of Technology have announced that they finally have solid evidence for a planet X, a true ninth planet on the edge of our solar system. So you say to yourself, how could these Sumerians know this, now have this knowledge? And how can Cain receive this mark if there was no one but Adam and Eve? Who are these Nephilim, these Emites, etc.? And the Egyptian hieroglyphics, you look at some of them, you find flying aircraft engraved in them, things that look like helicopters, discs. Now let's talk about some of these saints. Saint Padre Pio of Pietralcina. There's a book that is in Italian, published in 1978, entitled Così parla Padre Pio. Thus speaks Padre Pio, that bears the imprimatur and the heel of star. Now, the Catholic Code of Canon Law states that when it gives a magisterial seal, when any bishop gives a magisterial seal of approval, namely the imprimatur or the heel of star, that it may be displayed and even sold in churches throughout the world in all dioceses. And Cardinal Raymond Burke, as well as the translator of the Second Vatican Council documents, Father Jordan Amen, both uphold the teaching that it is reprehensible for anyone to publicly oppose a work that bears this magisterial seal of approval that's backed by canon law. Padre Pio's work bears the seal, and in it he states, when asked by a friar, that if aliens or Martians, as they call them, exist on other planets, he says, Ebbe, voi che non esistono, certamente che esistono, which, which is, why, do you not want them to exist? Of course they exist. And then he goes so far as to say that some of them are without sin. They were not affected by original sin like we were. Because the angels don't have original sin from parent to offspring like we do. Some of these ETs don't have that cause-effect relationship like we do as well. But I'm not saying they're all good, they're all bad. Again, you started this question with a third of this, the beings fell. When a third of the stars fall, that includes in its sweep all that which is under that star system, including those entities that Monsignor Corrado Balducci called sentient beings. He said that they're neither angels nor humans. They have physical bodies like we do. They die like we do. 
but they're neither human nor angels. And again, this is not me speaking. I'm quoting to you from reliable sources. I spoke of the, the archeological, the geographical, hagiographical, and then lastly, the testimonial evidence. I personally witnessed exorcisms with people who had been physically abducted. There are millions of testimonies throughout the world and the exorcists will tell you that they have cast out demons that were neither human nor angelic. They were other entities. And I'm not saying this on my own behalf. Other exorcists have told me this as well. These craft are real physical objects. There were, in some cases, non-human pilots. When you have this governmental evidence with testimonies, you run into notable names that worked for the government of Canada, like Paul Hellier. He was the uh, Canadian Minister of National Defense, and he worked as an engineer. He was the Minister of Parliament and is the longest serving member of the Queen's Private Council for Canada, Queen of England. And he publicly rebuked the world leaders for hiding all this evidence, which he has copies of in his declassified files. They were classified, they became declassified, he shared them with a group of people when he presented a speech in 2013. This is a reputable man who worked for the government for many years. My name, as I said, was Paul Hellyer. I'm a former Minister of National Defense for Canada. I served in three governments during a total of 23 and a half years as a member of parliament. And then you have other people like Colonel Philip Corso, who worked for the government, and he speaks in his book about his personal contact with these mm -hmm. beings. So it is a devout Catholic. And Sergeant, who died this year actually, Clifford Stone, I read his book, on his experience with the government and working with UFOs as well. Bruno Samachicha, he was a theologian, a lay theologian, who participated with Paul VI. It was in 1977, uh, National Eucharistic Congress in Pescara, Italy. And he put out a book, Bruno Samachicha, a theologian, in 1977, entitled Les Miracles Eucharistiques de Longchamp, which in English is the Eucharistic Miracle of Longchamp. In Italian, it was published, his native language in 73, and then in 77, the translation in French, to which Saint Pope John Paul II appended his dedication. Now, at the time, in 77, the Pope was still Archbishop of Krakow, but he dedicated Bruno Samachich's book to the Catholic Church. He was visited by extraterrestrials and he wrote all about this, but he did not want this to be revealed until after his death. Much like Admiral Byrd, he also did not want until his death for the, his experience to be revealed of what he saw in the North Pole when he went there. But Bruno Samachicha, again, is a reputable individual. He's an academic. He published over a hundred books. He was a distinguished figure in academic circles. Basically in the 1956, a group of ETs appeared to him according to his memoirs and they were good and they shared to him things about how to be better in the world, improve the society in which we live and things like that. But on the flip side, as I mentioned, you have the bad ones and that, in my opinion, refers to that one third that mm -hmm. fell with Lucifer. In addition to Bruno Samachicha, as I mentioned, there was the astronomer of the Vatican, Father Jose Funes from Argentina, who stated that we should believe in extraterrestrials and he considers them extraterrestrial brothers as does Pope John Paul II. He said, these extraterrestrials are our brothers. And Pope Francis stated that if a Martian showed up, that's the word he used in Italian, Marziano, and asked to be baptized, the Martian, how would we react? These are the words of Pope Francis. Now, why did the Pope bring up the idea of baptism? Because the Vatican astronomer who succeeded Father Jose Funes, brother Guy Consolmagno, put out a book entitled, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? The church, the Vatican is giving consistent attention to this reality because the Vatican has put out several articles and statements, both in Osserto Toro Romano, as well as in the Italian Corriere della Sera, La Stampa, Italian newspapers, stating that theologians should explain the theology of the Catholic faith in conjunction with the possibility of extraterrestrial life, showing that there is no 
disruption, disparity, but that it works together homogeneously. So the church feels like we should have these conversations and explore these oh, possibilities. It's encouraging theologians to address it, not asking, it's encouraging them. So it's my duty to address this. And that's why I'm doing this video with you because the government's coming out more and more with this reality. That the U.S. government and U.S. military contractors possess at least 12 or more alien spacecraft, some of which they shared with AARO or the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Reputable individuals in the church have confirmed that they exist. Let's take, for example, the Blessed Virgin Mary. She stated to the four seers of Garabanda that they exist. And she stated this at Medjugorje as well. So did St. Padre Pio or Pietro Alcina, Blessed Anne or Catherine Emmerich. So did um, Venerable Andrea Beltrami. And then we have Pope John XXIII, who was also a saint, canonized on the same day as Pope John Paul II, who had a personal visitation of an extraterrestrial. Mm. This is testified to by Cardinal Capovilla, this happened in 1961 in July at Castel Gondolfo. So there is ample evidence, and I'm not even going into other reputable examples of the church that have testified to this reality, that these extraterrestrials are neither angels nor they're humans, but they are sentient beings, rational beings with an intellect, with a volition, that die like we do. So it's my job as a theologian to qualify and explain within the context of the Christian Catholic faith how this possibility fits within the paradigm of doctrine. So Father, you talked about reputable, reliable sources and testimony. So I would like to underscore this Monsignor Balducci that you mentioned a few times because his credibility has been questioned recently. Balducci is known for testifying that Padre Pio believed in extraterrestrials. And those who do not like this testimony, they question the reliability of who he is and how is it backed up. Monsignor Balducci put forward a paper to the caption order entitled UFOlogy and Theological Clarifications. He was a member of the Vatican Curia. He was an exorcist of the Archdiocese of Rome. He was a colleague of Father Amorth. So it points that he's a very reliable source. Is there anything we don't know about him? Is there any reason to believe that he might have made up that story about Padre Pio? No, not a shred of evidence to go there. Just the opposite. Everything documented confirms that this was an authentic statement of Padre Pio. A friar was informed by Padre Pio that these ETs are real. Let me put it this way. People that are unable to, in the present, compartmentalize this new knowledge within the schematic of the Catholic faith that they were brought up with have as a defense mechanism, almost as a flight or fight mechanism, res resistance, just to preserve their faith. And I get that. That's That caution is good. But don't be so quick to condemn something that the church has not yet condemned. And it won't condemn this, in my opinion. And there's archaeological evidence, testimonial evidence, governmental evidence of people that work for the government that come out with this. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. No, I think there's a, um, of course, there's a negative stigma about the possibility of alien life. But I think the more people become aware of the evidence and the reliable sources that point to this possibility, and also the, the threat, the perceived threat that because of the association that aliens might have had with atheism or anti-Christian thinkers, I think that threat begins to wear down the more we discover these reliable sources and understand more about it. Yeah, there is a threat because what you're having on primetime television are programs that are availing themselves of this possibility 
to lead you away from Christianity. Mm -hmm. These programs try to instill within you a false doctrine mm -hmm. that we came from aliens. God did not create us. Mm -hmm. And this is a threat because on the one hand, you're not able to compartmentalize this new knowledge. And on the other hand, you're looking to do so while being fed disinformation by other sources. So it's not easy to focus on what the church teaches here. And therefore, I understand why they reject it, mm -hmm. but it requires a lot of experience in the fields of these disciplines I shared with you of anthropology, geology, theology, science, etc. Connecting all this information and data, you see that there's a big mosaic, a big picture that is connected. And it's and one cannot just simply dismiss that to preserve what they consider to be their interpretation of the catechism or the faith. May the blessing of Almighty God through the intercession of the new Adam and the new Eve, Jesus and Mary, descend upon you and remain with you always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>